I go and do a seminar at a place called Edinburgh College, which has, I think, one of the finest music departments in the country. They're a fantastic bunch of kids, and the uh, professionals there are also excellent. I did a seminar this year about a question I don't think we ask enough in the music industry, so I thought I'd run that with you. But there is one catch. And that is that I used a whole bunch of material from YouTube that would probably get me several copyright strikes. So if you don't mind, there's a whole bunch of links in the comments section below. If you click each of those into a new tab in your browser, that will prepare your seminar deck. You may also want to let the little four second adverts run and then hit pause on each of those tabs so this seminar isn't interrupted every few minutes by the sound of a ukulele, a glockenspiel and someone whistling. The question I think we need to ask ourselves, I arrive at kind of in three stages. And it doesn't apply just to media composers, it's for all music makers, but it certainly takes the experience I've had as a media composer and applies it to the more kind of general act of making music. So the first question I'd like to ask is, what does film and TV music actually do? Pardon? For me, and speaking in just like really broad terms, it does three things. So what is the first? Well, this is your opportunity. If, if I'm currently living in tab one, it's gonna be that side, isn't it? Move along to tab two and hit play and stop after his head comes out of the cheese. You'll know what I'm talking about. So this, I think, is a brilliant example of, I believe it's called mise-en-scene. He's basically, the composer is, is representing and emphasizing what we can already see. So there's, I think there's about seven or eight spots in that short section. He, he's setting the scene. I think he's using scary music to say it's late at night and there's something weird going on. He then marks the fact that there's the cucumber is holding open the uh, fridge door. He's then uh, uh, presenting us with uh, little uh, Jerry and uh, the fact that Jerry's kind of doing something cheeky. Uh, he's then marking the point that he's gone off to get something. He's then marking the point that Jerry is carrying something that's too heavy, it's making him wobbly. When Jerry puts his foot on the celery, he's suggesting that the celery's slippery and this is gonna be awkward. He emphasizes the drop, the fact that he's bumped his bottom and that probably hurts. And then when the cheese comes down on top, he's telling us something we didn't know, and that is that the hole that he's putting his head through is too small for his head, so he has to squeeze it through. So he's basically marking what we already see whilst contextualizing two things at either end that we may not understand. One, that it's late at night, and two, that the cheese hole is too small for his head. Play the next tab, tab number, I've already lost count, so I'll put it on the screen. Okay, so this is a familiar beach scene. Well, what do we know about this? Okay, we're by the seaside and it looks to me like sunset, but it could be sunrise. Um, how can we get the music to help us understand this scene better? Okay, so what the music is doing for us here is I think it's suggesting that it's sunset, that it's party time, we're somewhere exotic, and it is probably quite a warm, heady evening ahead. So if we try just one more piece of music, so stay on this tab with the visual, but play the music with this tab on underneath. Now we know that the sea is full of fucking sharks. So this for me is the first kind of major role of music in TV and film, contextualization. How about number two? In the next tab, the music is clearly helping to provide motivation for the protagonists here. Uh, why are they doing this? Well, there's a consequence to their actions, I believe. They're up against the clock. Um, they feel motivated. They need to do something. They're going to engage in some form of kind of conflict and resolution. I also think this scene is hysterical because I think Mr. T, I could just imagine that now the prop masters give him a screwdriver to use and it's like, no man. Bierbrack has got to have, have a much, much bigger screwdriver than that. It's just absolutely enormous. So this for me is the second role of music in TV and film, and that is to provide a degree of consequence to the actions of the characters. So first is context, second is consequence. And that's enough. That's all film and TV music has to do if you want it to, context, consequence. I mean, take for example quiz shows. Look at these three, Van, 
you know, what, what do we need to know about him, that he's a Hugh Grant lookalike? Sandra, well, she lost all the money on the GGs and she's relying on the quiz show prize money to get her cash back. And John's a tax inspector. Don't know about you, but I'm team Sandra. And that's about all you need to kind of really know or care about the contestants in order to kind of maintain your interest in that show and watch the commercials in between the kind of ad breaks. Uh, the music, I guess, will give you a sense of occasion, it'll give a sense of motivation, the clock's ticking, and that will tell you if they've won or they've lost, and that's good enough. And during the early days of movie music, you know, to the silent movies, this is all that music did. You know, it had to emphasise all these points because you couldn't hear what they were fucking saying. Until this guy came along. You see, the thing is, Bernard Herrmann, he didn't come from the silent movie brigade. He came from radio, but not just any old radio, because he worked with this bloke, Orson Welles. And their most notable appearance on radio would have been Orson Welles' production of War of the Worlds. Orson Welles wanted people to really feel what it would be like to be invaded by aliens. So he tricked an entire country into thinking they were being invaded by aliens in the shape of a fake newscast. It caused outrage, people taking to the streets. But what he achieved was truly giving people a sense of what it would be like to be under attack. And when Bernard Herrmann took this sense of, you know, making people feel something for real, into the movies he did with Alfred Hitchcock, it was to change film music forever. So if you look at the next tab, mute it and play it with the tab further along. Now you've got to imagine the tab further along is coming out of her car stereo. What I get out of watching this kind of footage like that is that she's kind of mildly concerned that she can't see properly. Uh, it's, a, it's a frustration to her. She needs to be careful. Now, if you run that tab again without the kind of Rihanna underscore and with the actual um, Bernard Herman score, I think the results are very different. This scene now kind of tells you that she's in a blind panic. It turns out in the story that she's committed a heinous crime. She's scared of being caught. She needs to get somewhere quick. And what Bernard Herman has done here He's told you what this woman is thinking. It's by far not the most famous scene which Bernard Herrmann scored. Indeed, the most famous, I don't know, scene, the most famous, dare I say it, piece of music ever. I mean, even my little kind of five-year-old kids know what <coughs> means. Watch this next tab without the sound first, and then with. So with this wizardry, He's made you understand what someone is thinking and what someone is feeling, what the pain feels like. Therein, I think, lies the third magic thing that film and TV and music can do, and that is to not encourage or teach you, but actually make you empathise. So I guess, to take this question, what does a good film or TV score do? Um, and kind of wrap it up, you know, take it away from these three points and wrap it up into a, just a broader single statement. That is to help tell a story. You know, how do you define a good storyteller? Sorry, I'm not as good at remembering lines as my parents, but I'm just gonna consult my notes. For me, the best storytellers make us feel like we're actually there, make us understand what motivates the characters, make us care for the characters, make us feel for the characters, and most of all, make us empathise. But what is empathy? It's such a difficult word to define. So your kid brother comes into your bedroom, nicks your Nintendo Switch, and as he runs out, you go and try and grab him, you stub your toe on your bed. Now, a common response would be, oh, that sounds like it hurt. Is your foot okay now? Is this empathy? No, this is sympathy. This is you putting yourself in that person's shoes and imagining how you would react. Empathy would be, well, knowing you, 
bet it took you a good couple of hours to calm down before you could go and even see your brother without ripping his head off. That's putting yourself in that position, the pain of stubbing one's toe, but also with your knowledge of that person and their personality, how they're likely to react in that circumstance. So you're not putting yourself in their shoes, you are putting yourself in them, if you know what I mean. Empathy is understanding the context of the situation, understanding the consequence of the actions people take and understanding how they feel and why they take those actions, understanding why it's likely that Juliet would probably commit suicide and so would Romeo. It's all about telling stories. It reminds me of a scene in a film from my youth called Ferris Bueller's Day Off. One of the characters is this rich kid who doesn't get any attention from his dad and he's suffering from well, what it certainly kind of looks like to be kind of locked in syndrome. He lacks the ability to feel. And there's this one kind of extraordinary, quite indulgent scene in an art gallery. So check that out in the next tab. For me, my interpretation of that scene is, I think his name is Cameron, isn't it? Um, it's an awakening. It's a spark of a feeling which leads to a broader awakening later on in the film. And that, for me, defines art. You know, you can look at a pretty sight, a pretty kind of scene. You can uh, hear sounds. But to experience art, to experience music, is to feel. It is my belief that when you feel, you understand. And when you understand, you learn, and when you learn, you grow. I don't know if you tried this experiment with me before. If you play the next sequence in the next tab, extraordinary sequence from Good Morning Vietnam. Now mute that one and play what's on the tab behind it underneath. So rerun the Good Morning Vietnam video, but with the sound from the one on the next tab along. In theory, it should work but it doesn't. You know, it's just like the first track, the Louis Armstrong track, it's, a, it's quite a cheesy song, major key, guy with a funny voice singing. Well, in the second track, I think the lyrics fit even better to describing what's going on at the beginning of the montage. But there's just something not quite right about it. It just doesn't feel right. And as a consequence, the experience of the montage is totally transformed. Wasn't it Quincy Jones who said paralysis through analysis? I think it's a trap we fall into time and time again, becoming obsessed with the technicalities of what we do, as opposed to how it makes you feel. I read articles in Sound on Sound about how to EQ a kick drum. Well, surely the question should be, well, what was wrong with the kick drum in the first place? You know, I go to forums like VI Control and you see people poring over the technicalities of people doing orchestral demos and whether it sounds realistic or not. And I've never read anyone say, how does it make you feel? We've got this amazing kind of extraordinary thing happening in the music industry, which is the resurgence of vinyl, you know, LPs, records. And people are kind of debating whether records sound better than digital. The thing is, I went to the record shop to buy this. So already I've done something that is so much more committed to this recording than just hitting click twice on iTunes. And then what do you do next? Well, you get your teeth around it, obviously. It's funny how you have the muscle memory for these things. And you unwrap it. And there's not a human being on this planet who hasn't been a child at some point who doesn't love the sensation of unwrapping. What next? Well, I have this texture and this, this photograph and oh, it's a gatefold. So my entire kind of vision, most of my peripheral vision is taken up by these players, this creation. And then it smells of cardboard and glue. And then I take out this really thick bit of vinyl and I'll put it on and there'll be a popping sound as the, as the, as the needle hits the record, which will announce that it's about to begin. You know, does it sound better than digital? I don't think it's the point. How I feel about this? Well, it's a much, much bigger commitment to this experience than the two clicks. What I'm gonna do is probably sit down. It's gonna be impossible for me to kind of skim along to the next track because, you know, record players don't do that very well. And so this music is not gonna be the underscore to my life. 
I'm going to climb inside this guy's life and knowing this guy, he's probably going to terrify me. I so often get people asking me how to go about writing in the style of X or, or in the style of Y and uh, you know when I'm working with clients it's always you know I think something that's a bit kind of John Adamsy or this that and the other and I just think the question we should ask is what story are we trying to tell? What feelings are we trying to convey? And then the job is to go and sit there and write some music until you're conveying those feelings or the story has been told. You know, if you're sitting there going, oh God, I think the, the kick drum's too loud, but I'm covered in goosebumps, it's probably there. It's probably good enough. So whilst we can discuss theory, we can discuss the technical kind of aspects of our craft, I just urge us from time to time to ask that question, how does it make you feel? Windy and cold. Thanks as always for washing these waffles. Um, if you haven't subscribed yet, uh, plenty of exciting stuff to come, waffly stuff. Uh, if you like this video, one of those would be great. And if you want to be notified the next time I put up a video, hit the little bell. See you next time. Oh, caveat, little uh, thing. Saying how does it make you feel is great, but that doesn't give you the license to say to someone who is maybe performing a vocal or playing something on your music or you're producing someone else's music, it doesn't give you license to say, sorry, just not feeling it. 